and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing large independent sets in triangle free graphs. So what about independent sets? Well, you might recall the greedy independent set bound, that if G is a graph on n vertices, then the independence number of G, that's the size of a maximum independent set in G, denoted alpha of G, is at least n over delta of G plus one, where of course delta of G is the maximum degree of G. So why is that? Well, it follows from the greedy coloring bound that chi of g, that's the chromatic number of g, is the most delta of g plus one, and that follows from the greedy algorithm, so just greedily coloring the vertices in any order. And why does that imply the above independent set bound? So I want to pause the video and think about that. So the answer is simple. It's because alpha of g is at least n over chi of g. So if we had this chi of g coloring, then the average color class would have size n over chi of g, so there'd be at least one of that size in every color class as an independent set. Now, a good question though is, can we replace delta of g above by average degree? So this is a really nice question. Why do we need the maximum degree there? And I'm also, as a notational note, I'm gonna let ad of g denote the average degree of g, so it's the average of the degrees of the vertices of g. So can we do this? Well, I won't have you to stop and think about this. The answer is yes. This follows from the following theorem of Caro and Way, and that was independently proved by Caro and Way in 1999. The theorem says that if G is a graph, then alpha of G is at least the sum over V, the vertices in G, one over the degree of V plus one. So the set goes with the individual degrees of the vertices, and I'm summing there. And then the claim is that this gives us a corollary that if g is a graph on n vertices, then alpha of g is at least n over the average degree of g plus one. So why is this? Again, you might want to pause, stop the video, and think about why this follows. The answer is it follows from Carr away since f of x equals one over x plus one is a convex function. So then if we're taking that sum, we can instead replace it by the sum of the averages. So that would be the n, there's n terms in that sum, and we would take the average degree of g uh, plus one. So that gives us this average degree version of that greedy independence set bound that follows from this car away version where you use the actual degrees. And that leads to the question of how do we actually prove this car away theorem? So there are a couple different proofs. So you could take a maximum degree vertex, uh, just delete it, and then it turns out the formula gives what you want on the smaller graph. You can take a minimum degree vertex, delete it in its neighbors, and then add back from an independent set by induction. Those both work and they're nice and they're short, but instead I'm gonna do a short probabilistic proof as this is a probabilistic methods class. So this one's quite nice. So let's do it. We're gonna let V1 up to Vn be a random ordering of V of G. That's a random permutation. So chosen uniformly of over all permutations in the vertices. And here's the crucial definition. We're gonna let I be VI, where N of VI, sorry, that's a typo, should, is a subset of VJ, J greater than I, i.e. VI is before all of its neighbors. So now what does that give us? Well, the claim is then I is an independent set. So why is that? So I might wanna stop again, pause and think why, when we get the I this way, do we get an independent set? Well, if V i V j is an edge in i with i less than j, then V j actually can't be an i. It would have an earlier neighbor. So by picking these ones that are first among all those neighbors, all their neighbors would guarantee an independent set. And that leads to the question, what is the size of i or the expected size of i? Well, what's the probability that a vertex V i is an i? Well, it's one over D of V i plus one. Why is that? Well, among all the sub-permutations of it and its neighbors, if you count it and its neighbors, there's d v of i plus one of those. There's a one over d v i plus one chance that v i is the first among them. And then that carries over all permutations as it doesn't really matter what the other vertices do in the ordering. And then by linearity of expectation, the expected size of i would be the sum of these probabilities, which would give us the sum one over d of v plus one, uh, and then of course, there exists an I with I at least the expectation, and that's an independent set of large enough size as desired. So that's the proof of the Carraway theorem, but intriguingly, it actually is related to Turan's theorem. 
So we talked about this last class. You might recall this theorem of Turan from 1941 that if g is kr free, then the number of edges of g is at most 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 n squared over 2. So why does this follow? Well, it's again a corollary of Carr away. Since g is kr free, alpha of g bar, that's the complement, is the most r minus 1, right? The clique number of g is the most r minus 1, so the independence number of the complements are most r minus 1. So we can apply car away, or rather that corollary, to show that alpha of g bar is at least n over the average degree of the complement of g plus 1, which is equal to n over n minus the average degree. So why is that? Well, the degrees and the degrees and the complements sum to n minus 1, so the average degree of g bar is actually n minus 1 minus the average degree of g, and then those minus and plus 1s cancel. We get n minus the average degree, and then this can be rewritten with a bit of arithmetic as the average degree of g is at most n minus n over r minus 1 as desired, because then we divide by 2 to get uh, the theorem above. So that's the Turan's theorem where we're just looking at an upbound, and again, Turan's is a classical theorem in the classical theorem, really, an extreme graph theory showing how many, what's the maximum number of edges we can have in a KR free graph. Uh, that's not the exact number, rather, they're these Turan graphs, which are these complete r minus 1 partite graphs with roughly equal size that have been known. That's kind of the real full Turan's theorem to be the exact number. And indeed, with a bit more work, the proof of Carraway implies the full Turan's theorem. So it actually shows that the Turan ones are the optimal one. Why is that? It's because you would need a quality to hold throughout then. And what would that mean? Well, so it would mean the degrees would have to be roughly of equal size, first of all. But secondly, in that proof, when we were doing this independent set choice, it means there somehow can't be more than the expectation that we had derived. So this process should be actually always equal. And it turns out if you had uh, two neighbors that were not adjacent, you could actually get some chance uh, that they would both appear first, and, and then this uh, ends up saying that the expectation we did was an underestimate, and so it's not tight. So altogether, we won't go through those details, but it would show that the complement would actually have to be the disjoint union of r minus 1 cliques of roughly equal size, which is the complement of the Turan graph. So that's how you would derive Turan. So there's a nice connection between these car away, these average degree bounds and extremal graph theory. But we wanted to turn our attention toward the question of triangle free graphs. So can we do better than these greedy bounds if G is triangle free? So that's a good question. And the answer is yes. There's a theorem of Itai, Komlosh, and Samaretti from 1980 that says if G is triangle free with maximum degree delta, delta at least one here, then alpha of g is at least omega n log delta over delta. And that's the natural log there. Uh, it doesn't really matter since it's up to constant. So that's quite nice. We can get this somewhat extra log factor, log delta factor, more than that greedy bound. Now, I will say that Shearer in 1983 improved the constant to 1 minus little of 1. That's with that natural log, though. Uh, 1 minus little of 1, which is very good. So it's actually known uh, that... You know, you can't do too much better, but uh, Shearer's definitely improves the constant a lot. They didn't, I tell you, Komlosh and Samaretti did not really try to optimize, but Shearer's has, is a really nice proof. And more than that, Shearer actually proved the following. He proved that if G is triangle free with average degree, let's call it D, little d there, at least one, then alpha of G is at least one minus the law of one N log D over D. So actually, you can get an average degree version of his theorem and, and of, therefore of the itai komlosh samaretti theorem. So this improves on that the car away bound, again, if we're triangle free. So that's a really nice theorem, and it has a really nice proof. The proof is elegant, and it's short, yet it's a bit finicky. So we're not going to be doing this today, uh, because, again, it uses differential equations and parameters and doesn't give you a lot of intuition as to why it ends up working. So instead, we're opting to follow along and prove the following. We're going to show if G is triangle free with maximum degree D at least 1, then alpha of G is at least n log D over 8D, and that log is base 2, not the natural log. So this would give us a version of the Itai Komlosh Samaretti, better constant actually than they had. Uh, it doesn't quite get us 
to shearers, but, and again, we're assuming maximum degree, but this is, again, for the purposes, it might not be, in a way, a shorter proof, it's about the same, but it maybe will be slightly easier to understand and conceptually simpler. So how we're going to do this is going to take a number of slides. Let's begin uh, the proof. So for d less than 16, I'll just note that this follows from that trivial bound that alpha of g is at least n over d plus 1. So you can just do out the arithmetic there. If we know if it's at least n over d plus 1, you can check for d less than 16. That's at least n log d over 8d. And so we may assume d is at least 16. And now here's the key thing. We're going to let w be a random independent set chosen uniformly among all independent sets of g. So this is a bit strange of a probabilistic setup. We're having w be this random independent set chosen uniformly among all independent sets of g. Why is that strange? Because we don't really have a grasp of what the independent sets are, right? G is just some triangle free graph. So somehow I'm randomly choosing from the set and there could be very many of them. So it might be hard to enumerate such a probabilistic space there. But again, this is not for algorithmic purposes here. We're just doing it as an existence proof. So this is a fair setup for the probabilistic space. Now, where do we go from there? Well, we're going to define a key variable. So for every vertex v in v of g, we're going to define a random variable xv, which will be d times the size of v intersect w plus n of v intersect w. So what is this strange variable? Well, so v intersect w is 1 if v is in w and 0 otherwise. So basically, it would be that first term would be d if v is in the independent set and 0 otherwise. And what's the second term? It's the number of neighbors in the independent set. But you'll note that if v is in w, then the second term is zero, right? The, no, the kind of any neighbors in w, because it's an independent set. So basically, if v is in w, we put d, and if v is not in w, we just record the number of neighbors that are in w. So that explains that strange construction of a random variable. And now here's the key claim that for every vertex in v of g, the expected size of x of v is at least log d over 4. So how are we going to prove this? Well, it has quite a nice proof. It goes as follows. We're going to let h be g minus v union n of v. So we're going to delete v and its neighbors. And then where do we go from there? We're going to fix an independent set s and h. And it suffices to show that the expected size of xv conditioning on w intersect v of h being s is at least log d over 4. So what is this saying? We're saying, so delete v and n of v, v and its neighbors. And now suppose that the enemy gives you an independent set in what remains. So the enemy fixes that S is this independent set on what remains. We have to show that given conditioning on that, then this expected size of XV is still log D over 4. So somehow, no matter what the enemy does outside of the neighborhood of V, we'll still show this conditional expectation is large. And then that shows in all cases that indeed over everything it's large. So how are we going to do that? Well, to that end, we're going to let z be the set of non-neighbors of s and n of v, and we're going to let little z be the size of big z. So why is that? Why is it good? Well, z is somehow the candidates for where to extend this independent set. So, right, so what can we do with this independent set s? Well, we could add v, right, because we don't have any of its uh, neighbors, but we could also add non-neighbors of s. So non-neighbor of s, meaning not doesn't have any neighbor uh, in s there. Those would be potential candidates. So we could add some of them. And indeed, there are precisely 2 to the z plus 1 possibilities for w. So again, you might want to pause and think about what these are. So the answer is there's s union v. As I said, you can add v, but then there's really no options, right? Then you can't add any of the neighbors. Alternatively, you could not add v, and then you could add a set y, where y is any subset of z. So you can choose any set of those non-neighbors, any subset of z, and why is that? Because it's triangle-free. So any of those set of neighbors, because it's triangle-free, form an independent set, so it would also be an extension. So those are all the very possibilities. So there's one with v, and there's two to the z, of course, when you're adding these subsets of z. So where for, to go from there? Well, we now calculate this conditional expectation. So the expectation of xv conditioned on w intersect v of h equals s. Well, what does the formula say? Remember that first term was d, and it was d if and only if v was in w. So that only happens in the first case, which happens 1 over 2 to the z plus 1 times, right? So each of these extensions is equally likely. So it would get d only in the first one. 
For the other ones though, uh, they don't get anything from the first term, but that second term comes into fig. How many neighbors are in uh, the independent set, which is precisely the size of y. So we're gonna get the sum over y subset of z of y times one over two to the z plus one. Now, a little bit of enumeration calculations show that that second thing, the sum, is actually equal to z times two to the z. So we get d over two to the z plus one plus z times two to the z over two to the z plus one. And now we're almost done. We just have to think about uh, what this is at least given various z, so somehow optimizing. But we can kind of do a little trick and break this up. So if z is small, so if it's at most log d minus log log d, the first term is actually at least log d over two. Why is that? Because then two to the z uh, would be d over log d, and d over log d should be larger at least than one, so we could write 2d over log d uh, there, and then that would give, those would cancel out and you get a log d over 2. And again, both terms are non-negative, so it just suffices to use one of them. And indeed, for the other case where z is at least log d minus log log d, I claim that's at least log d over 2, since d is at least 16, so you can check that that inequality actually holds when d is at least 16, and then that gives us what we want because 2 to the z over 2 to the z plus 1 is always at least at half for all z at least 0 because 2 to z is always at least 1 then. And then that means that somehow that second term we have one term that's half and one term that's log d over 2 so we get log d over 4. Again the first term now negative and then we're done. So that proves the claim and now we're ready to finish the proof. So how do we do this? We're going to let x be the sum of these x v, very natural. And then here's the important part. Note that for every w, x would be what? It'd be the sum of these x, v's. So if we work that through, it's d times the sum of v and v of g of v in w plus the sum of v and v of g of n of v intersect w. But we can rewrite this, right? What's the sum of v in intersect w? So that's just a 1 if v is in w. So that would actually, that sum would just be the size of w. The second term, so what is it counting? It's counting you know, how many neighbors do I have in W over all the vertices? If you kind of invert that, it's really counting for every vertex U in W, its number of neighbors, i.e. its degree. And now we can upper bound that because the degrees are at most D, the second one's at most D times W, so the whole thing's at most 2D times the size of W. So we've established that for every W, which means that the expected size of x is always is at most 2d times the expected size of w. And now we're very close to done because by linearity of expectation, we get a lower bound. The expected size of x would actually equal the sum of the expected size of the xv's, which would be at least n times log d over 4 using the claim, right? The expected size of the xv's were at least log d over 4. And hence, the expected size of w, if you do out the arithmetic, is at least n log d over 8d. So there exists a w with at least that expectation. And again, w was always an independent set. It was randomly chosen among all possible. So somehow the average is at least that, so there is one bigger, and that's then as desired. And this concludes the proof of our theorem. So now in the time remaining, I just wanted to talk a little bit about further direction. So one natural question is what about for coloring? Well, the girth of a graph G, we'll def define here, is the length of the shortest cycle in G, and a very seminal result of Kim in 1995 showed that if G has girth at least 5, then chi is at most 1 plus a little 1 delta over uh, natural log there of delta of G. So what is that saying? Well, if your girth at least 5, that's precisely meaning no triangles and no 4 cycles. So somehow, if we also exclude 4 cycles, we can get this chromatic version with also that really nice constant as in shear is a one plus little o one. And I just want to note that there actually exist delta regular graphs of arbitrary girth with chi at least one half minus little one delta over log delta there. So you get this gap of, of a factor of two that we don't know about, but somehow the, the natural question of would you, could you go to higher girth and do much better? The answer is no. So up to a constant, this is correct and therefore would imply that independent set version for uh, girth 5 graphs. But actually, Johansson in 1996 showed that if G is triangle free, then chi is on the, also on the order of delta over log delta. Quite a nice result in a non-published manuscript. Um, the constant was improved in 2015 to 4 plus little o1 by Petty and Sue, and to 1 plus little o1 by Malloy in 2017. 
a very nice proof that then matches Kim's bounds, so it's a generalization of Kim's, and then a generalization of Sears uh, for maximum degree, not for average degree, of course. So that all said, I'd also like to mention that Johansson in 96 and Malloy in 2017 showed that if G is KR free for a fixed constant R, then chi is actually a most uh, on the order of delta times a log log delta over log delta term. So there's an extra log log delta there, but in case you're wondering what if you go beyond triangle free, can you still somehow do better than greedy? And the answer, yes, maybe not quite as well, but still pretty good. And a major open connection there is whether the log log term can be removed. And that's still open. All right, now let's turn to our last topic here, which is Ramsey theory. So everyone loves Ramsey theory, and this is about R3K. So recall that R3K is the minimum number n such that any graph on n vertices has a triangle or an independent set of size k, right? So if you have these red-blue coloring, either we'd have a red triangle or blue, uh, you know, blue kk, and so if you view the edges with the red, so then either a triangle or in the complement, the non-edges, an independent set of size k there. So that's R3K, and it's quite natural if you're not looking at diagonal ones, somehow the first non-trivial, hard to understand one. So what is R3K? Well, a corollary of what we've done today from I, Tai, Kohn, Lush, and Semeretti in 1980 is that R3K is on the order of, uh, is at most K squared over log K. So this is an upper bound on that Ramsey number. So that was why everyone really loved that result. It was a big breakthrough that R3K was at most this K squared over log K. And then impressively, Kim in 95, showed a matching lower bound, so that it's omega k squared over log k. And hence, we know that R3k is actually theta, it's on the exact order of k squared over log k, when you combine these results. Now, that is the same Kim as before, but th that version is actually a probabilistic construction because it's a lower bound, and so with many pages, and we don't have time to do that. But very nice results. Now, let me show you how the corollary follows from what we've done. So proof of the corollary, let G be a triangle free graph on 8k squared over log k vertices. Case one is that delta of G is at least k. Then you'd have a vertex V with degree of V at least k. So let's say there's large maximum degree, then there's a vertex with such a large degree. And importantly, that means that N of V is an independent set since we're triangle free. And then that independent set would have size at least k because we have large degree. So somehow for just large degree, the neighbor set works there. And case two is that the max degree is small, it's less than k, so we can apply our theorem, so g has an independent set of size at least n log delta over eight delta, which then if you put in, n was 8k squared over log k, and then we times by log k over 8k, the log k is cancel, 8k is cancel, you just get a k as desired. So when the uh, maximum degree is small, we can actually just apply our previous theorem and get a large independent set as well. So a nice simple proof with these two different cases. So that's the proof of the corollary about Ramsey numbers. I will just wrap up by mentioning what are the best known bounds on R3k. Well, Shearer's better bound gives the best known upper bound, that R3 of k is at most 1 plus little 1 k squared over log k, same proof there. And then what about lower bounds? Well, independent work of Bowman and Kivash from 2021 and Fizz Ponteveros, Griffiths, and Morris from 2020 uh, gives the best known lower bound. And that's actually quite impressive. So these are very recent results, but that's a little bit of a lie as they actually come both from 2013. And they just took a very long time to get refereed and published as they're both quite long. But they give the best known lower bound that R3k is at least one quarter minus little o one k squared over log k. So quite nice matching bounds there. There is a factor four gap and that remains a major open problem in Ramsey theory. So again, there's somehow a factor uh, two gap on the chromatic number for the high growth graphs, major open problem. And here, this factor four, also a major open problem. But today we went ahead and talked about the car away bound, so improving the greedy bound uh, with average degree. Then we talked about triangle free graphs and we talked about improving their greedy bound for max degree and did the proof there, that was quite nice. Shear also improved it for average degree. Then we showed how those max degree bounds those independent set bounds implied nice results for R3K, for the Ramsey theory, uh, and used that all together and talked about the best known bounds.
So that's all for today. And actually, as this is the last uh, official lecture of the class, that's, that's all for the uh, class. So until we meet again, see you then.